All right, welcome back, peoples. I appreciate those who pre-planned and made sure that your flight didn't leave out in the middle of the session. <laughs> oh, okay. So now that we've gone under understanding the foundational Jedi and figuring out being like, how do these foundational concepts show up and manifest in our organizations and within ourselves, we're gonna move on to what are some of the tactical things that we can do um, to bring this work forward in our organization. So another resource for you that is uploaded and on your table is the Continuum of Becoming an Anti-Racist Multicultural Organization. That print is tiny, hence why you have samples on your table. Because I'm thinking, even if you at the front, it still look hecka tiny. <laughs> and so I like this tool because it is a start, it's a conversation starter, right? It is something that you can bring to your leadership and be like, hey, I got this at a conference and where do you think we're at? Because I know like we are, you know, some organizations, just like some people, we're like, oh, no, we're already doing the good work. Yep, I hear that we're already doing the good work. And in us doing our good work, where do you think we fall? And being honest and authentic is, a, is important, right? Not where you hope you fall, but where you really fall. <laughs> Right? And I love that, um, I also love this resource because it shows that it's a continuum, right? Like nobody is going to arrive at number six. Ain't none of us there, right? We're all on a journey toward six. Um, once we reach six, then I get to retire to the mountains next to a lake and make jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all, I'm cheering all of y'all on to make it to six. <laughs> Another conversation that comes up is what leadership buy-in do I need? And so if you can get C-suite buy-in, that is great. And if you can't get C-suite buy-in, I don't want you to feel like that is a hard stop. It's not, I promise. There are things that you can do. And not having C-suite buy-in doesn't mean that your work can't be started. It just means it needs to be started in a slightly different way. And sometimes not having them be aware of you beginning allows you to get some work done, providing them with direct examples of return on investment for the organization, which might help you secure the buy-in that you need to upscale your actions, right? And another way to secure buy-in at whatever level is it that you need, addressing health equity is a basic standard of practice now endorsed by several health-related governing bodies, including the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, HRSA, the, Amer uh, the Association of American Medical College, the CDC, right? All of these organizations have tools that say we should be addressing health equity. When I started with my prior organization, so I, my prior organization is a mid-size community health center that had a street outreach team, right? That was kind of like, we considered ourselves a stepchild, but it was, it was okay. It allowed us to do the work that we needed to do in the way that we needed to do it. And so when we started our work, we did not have C-suite buy-in. Quite frankly, I don't even think C-suite knew what we were doing. <laughs> didn't stop us from doing it though. Um, and while C-suite was still slow to take up this work, we chose as a team, so our, 
our health and human, our, yeah, our health and housing services team started and our school-based team started our own stuff. And so as time progressed and as social pressures increased, right, because this was after the public lynching of George Floyd, you know, all of a sudden, you know, if you weren't doing something, people were getting embarrassed. So they, we started, as our team, we started in like June or July. They didn't start, the organization as a whole didn't start until October. But we had already been doing our stuff for months. And so that, so like you do not need C-suite buy-in to get started. You can simply start on your team. You just need your supervisor's buy-in, right? So that you can start developing and implementing stuff. With a supervisor's buy-in, you can already start having those microaggressions, macroaggressions conversation. You can start cultivating those spaces on your team, right, or in your department. Right, you can start naming how whiteness is showing up within our department. I am one of the one of the many handouts that you were given um, in upload. It's not I didn't do paper. Um, I gave you six articles. Three, all of them discuss a return on investment. Three are business focused. So if your CEO is more of a business person, I've got three business articles. And I've got three medical-related articles, okay? So depending on who you're talking to, I tried to make sure that you had something for both sides. So you have that to actually be like, hey, not only is this ethically the right thing to do, it's good business, business practice, and here's your return on investment, and here's the documentation to prove it. I also included the Institute for Healthcare Improvements Toolkit Again, if your leadership is or, uh, medically focused, then you can use that being like, hey, this is a standard of practice that is being used in a variety of organizations across the country and has been in place. And they have wonderful, wonderful tools in there. Um, they have assessment tools. They have a grid being like, where am I at? Where do I need to go? They covered um, the social, um, drivers of health, they cover um, data, right? How do we like co collect data appropriately so that we can actually show that we have the, dis the disparities that we know exist, even if we didn't have the data before? So another tool I included. Um, having board buy-in, again, is helpful, but not mandatory. Um, and really depends on how involved your board is. I will say that one of the lessons that I learned um, at my prior org is that we didn't start with C-suite buy-in, we just did our own thing, got C-suite buy-in, was great, had C-suite turnover, um, and so now don't have C-suite buy-in and don't have board buy-in. Now, did that, does, has that stopped the work? No, because I just told you that that organization, right, is still doing equity work. It's all happening at the director level and below. And yes, they are working on the C-suite and the board. Um, and so if I could have gone back to the future, if I could have gone back, um, when I had C-suite buy-in, I think I would have worked harder to, to get board buy-in in hopes that our board would have held the new C-suite team more accountable. I, there's no guarantee that that would have worked, but it's something that I would have wanted to try. So, um, I went to a conference last week in Country Doctor, which is in uh, Seattle, so total shout out to my country doctor peeps. Um, Kush and Brandy did a presentation, and what they did that I really loved was they did their teams. They focused on their teams and in the clinics first, and they had somebody who was on the board who act as an advocate for doing this work and providing education to the board. And so if you've got a suite set up like that, use it. 
leverage it. Um, because when you do have C-suite turnover or turmoil, then you can leverage the support of the board in doing this work. Let's see, uh, how to curate your advocates and allies. So, when you don't have total top, actually when you don't have total top buy-in or um, even when you do, you need your allies. This is something that you need to figure out who these people are. On your table, dude, let's see. You have this really cute piece of paper. Um, and there's only a couple copies, because again, we're saving trees as much as possible. What I like about this is you are in the center, right? You are in the center, and then each pod represents a support person or an ally. So that is what I call your inner circle. It also could be your EDI committee. It could be your tiara committee, right? EDI is Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Tiara is Trauma-Informed Anti-Racism Alliance. Whatever you name it, it's your organization. And then in these sketchy boxes that aren't quite complete, those are potential allies, right? So as you're doing this work, it is good to map out who your peeps are, right? So that you know who, to, who I can call in. And if somebody needs to step out, right, from the inner circle, then you also have potential of other people to call in too, right, to take their place, to help carry this load, to help move it forward. I wanna say that your allies already exist. There is nobody who is in authentically interested in this work that has not been thinking about it over the last three years. So, they are out there, even if they're not on your radar. A couple of ways to develop your allies is look at whose passions are around increasing access. So who are your gender affirming care advocates? Who are your harm reduction advocates? Who are your food and housing ac access advocates? Who are your community health worker advocates? Your language service advocates, right? All of these people are potential partners and allies. Do an all call during staff meeting, being like, hey, we're gonna focus on health equity. Who's interested, right? This is how you can build your team. Another tool to use to either get buy-in or help present your case um, is looking at your COVID data, right? Um, one of the things that COVID did give us besides a headache and burnout and a whole bunch of other stuff is we got data on its impact for everybody. So when I talk to some people, so like I partner with some primary care associations and I'm gonna pick on Idaho because <laughs> I know David won't get mad at me. So Idaho, right, that patient population doesn't really have a big, um, BIPOC population, right? Like that is not who fills that state. And so for him, he was like, well, how do I have this conversation? I'm like, okay, so you don't, with him, I'm like, you don't approach race, right? You wanna look at the impact on ag workers. You wanna look at the impact on the poor, right? You wanna look at the impact on the queer community because they there, even if they all don't believe they there, they there, right? I'm like, so you just find your demographic and you find the info on them. And COVID, there's, there's impact on the BIPOC community, ag community, right? The queer community, there's impact on everybody. The elderly, right? Your veteran community. Just figure out who that community is and then find the equity tools and the resources, right? Like what was COVID's impact? or how have the social drivers negatively infect, um, impacted those patient populations? Uh, and that can help get you buy-in from other people who may typically be in like, not as open or not as ready to join and cheerlead. Um, let's see. Knowing your in-house experts also helps when it comes to making sure the work doesn't fade. Um, 
the more people that you use and uplift, um, the more it'll have more resiliency. You don't want to, it to, and it's very, very important that the work doesn't rest on one person. Because what happens if that person leaves? Right? You don't want the work to stop. You want it to continue on whether that person is there or not. And the reality is this work is about everybody's job. This equity work is everyone's responsibility. And putting it on one person is totally unfair. Totally unfair burden. And when you put it on one person, then you're limited to a single perspective. Also, not what equity about. Not what I'm like, right? Like, like that's, that's anti-equity, that's anti-inclusion, <laughs> right? So you want to make sure that everyone feels, everyone sees, and everyone knows like this is part of their job. And so ha again, having those allies, getting those people, getting those just um, diverse perspectives, also important. Um, having internal people who know knowledge. So on my outreach team, what we did was we built our own program first. And so each of us had a superpower. My superpower obviously was anti-racism, but somebody else's superpower was trauma-informed care. And somebody else's superpower was harm reduction. And so when we did our hiring, when we adjusted our hiring practices, each of us developed questions interview questions to be asked during the hiring process based on our superpower. When it came to onboarding that staff, new staff member, each of us developed content based on our superpower that was incorporated into our onboarding, right? So when they were with me, there was readings they had to do, and as we did patient care, right, I connected it back to the readings, and I connected it back to inequities. Right? Same thing when the, they were with the person who was trauma-informed care superpower, same thing with the person who did harm reduction, right? And this was, again, all within our little team. And then we applied it to school base. And then another department heard about it, and they were like, hold on, I want to get on, the, on this too, right? And, and it spread. And then eventually C-suite got on his board as well. Um, also knowing who your av um, advocates people are um, will also be help you to develop education materials because again, that's their superpower. So they can help you do that when you reach that roadblock of we don't have the money. And it's like, okay, well great. Well, Stacy volunteered to do this. And if we can't pay Stacy, we're gonna give Stacy time to do it while she's at work. And when Stacy's annual review comes around, we're gonna include this in her annual review to show that not only did she do her job, she also contributed to the professional development of the rest of the staff. And that shows initiative, that shows innovation, that shows leadership skills, that shows community, right? We're going to validate that for Stacy. Another resource that you can use, particularly if funds are limited, is some communities have community health boards. So out in Seattle where I'm at, we are totally spoiled. Um, and so we've had the Somali health board come in and talk to our staff about the, cult, the Somali culture and how that patient population may engage with us differently. Right, it's a, a it's partnering with the community total Jedi principle, right? It's helping us to be diverse, right? It's helping us to meet the needs of our patients. So look for your community health boards, see which ones are available and see how you can partner with them. Um, in Seattle, we're spoiled. We got Somali, Latinx, African-American, Afghan, Khmer, Filipino, Congolese. I was like, some of them I had to look up. There's like 13 more. Um, so, but they're a great source for providing context for need because they can tell your, they can particularly tell your leadership why we need to be having this conversation. They can also tell them how, what the return on investment would look like for doing this work um, and providing culturally responsive care for these communities. Next, normalize the conversation, right? Health equity or JEDI topics should be a standing on all meeting agendas 
it needs to be said and understood that this is not an additional item, but it's the very lens that we're gonna use to approach all aspects of the work that we do. So when we're collecting data, we're using a JEDI lens to collect that data, right? When we're training on de-escalation, we're using a JEDI lens and a trauma-informed lens, right? To do that, disc um, train on that de-escalation practice. It is not an additional thing. It is the actual lens that we use to do the work that we do on a daily basis. Another way to normalize the conversation that I did for my organization is we did, oh no, that's not what I want, hold on. Switch. We did a 21 day cha um, EDI challenge. And it doesn't have to be done in 21 days. But the 21 day challenge is a concept that's based on Dr. Eddie Moore of the Privilege Institute. And so what I did was for Black History Month, we did a 21 day challenge. Every week, every day had a different topic. I provided content in the form of articles, videos, um, sometimes it was podcasts. And then because I'm an overachiever in life, I also included journal and reflection questions. <laughs> um, and so again, this was A, it helps to educate. B, it helps to normalize the conversation, right? So get people used to having and talking about it. Country Doctor also did this with their board of directors. And what they did was over a year, they chose six topics based on the social drivers of health for their patient population. And so in January, the content would be provided to the board, and then in February, it would be discussed at the board meeting. And then the next topic would be given in March. They'd be given the content, and then they would discuss it the following month. And if there was a way for them to have hands-on practice, they would actually, so like, Food insecurity was one of the topics, clearly, um, something that all of our patient populations face. And so they actually took them out to a local um, farmer program that was situated in the central district and actually had them engage with a community partner around food insecurity and what that looks like and how we can address it. So loved that one. Um, Perfectionism came up for people with this. When we did this 21-day challenge, they were like, I couldn't get through at all, all of it. And I'm like, congratulations. You've got reading to do for the next three months. It's OK, right? <laughs> just, I'm like, do it, just do it, right? Just do it. Um, but all of these are ways to help normalize the conversations in your programs. Let's see, what else was on my little slide deck? Equity, oh, I, so I, equity champions. Um, so those are your advocates, your in-house experts. Equity champions I found also very helpful. Um, when, we, when I did get overarching org buy-in, I had an equity champion in every clinic and every department because they were really great at telling us that the our EDI Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, telling us if the things that we were rolling out had the impact that we wanted. It was a great way to get direct feedback, being like, hey, we rolled out this. Did it have the impact that we were hoping? Right? Did it match our intention? And because they're already part of the clinic or part of the department, they already have community with that team or that department, and so they're more likely to get honest answers on the impact and, be, and able to give us honest feedback. So, any questions? Okay. 
working with a Jedi lens. So again, when it comes to doing this work, one of the per, um, important things is making it clear from the beginning, it's not a side task, it's the lens that we do, and that it's a part of everyone's job. Depending on how far up you get buy-in with leadership will depend on your scope of your daily work. If you only get leadership buy-in from your team or department, like I said, it's fine, start there. And even if you only get it on your team or department, or if you get it on the bigger um, organizational, I encourage you draft definitions, a North Star, and figure out an equity lens so that you can actually make sure that you're embodying this work on the daily. And so one of our practices that we're gonna do today is def define what Jedi means for your table. We're gonna define an, an EDI statement for your table. And this is important because Jedi means different things to different people. And as I said in the beginning, one of the things that's most important is it's not a cookie cutter process. You need to customize it so that it has meaning and impact to your people because otherwise you're at risk of becoming performative, especially if it doesn't fit, right? So when you customize it, that way you make sure that it fits. And so totally encourage that. And having a North Star helps keep you on track. It helps give you direction. It helps give you a focus. When something comes up, you can look back and be like, hey, are we honoring, abiding, embodying the North Star that we said we were trying to reach by proposing this policy, by enforcing this practice. Make sense? Yeah? I'm not that familiar with North Star. Oh, um, no, th think mission vision statement. Um, organizations get a little sensitive when you call them mission vision because you know the C-suite be like, that's my job. Um, <laughs> so I just decided to get creative with my words. So yes, your North Star is just your goal, it's your mission, right? <laughs> it's like, this is what I want to accomplish. Uh, okay. But yes, so it gives you direction, it helps keep you on track, making sure that you're actually embodying what you wanna do. I encourage that your North Star actually um, embodies your org's mission and vision and the roots of community health or public health, right? If, the, if that's the, um, the area and environment that you work in. Because community health has social justice roots. I think just for many of us, it got lost in the business of healthcare. So. If you get C-suite buy-in, I highly um, advise doing a advisory committee. This committee should be comprised of people that hold various roles at various levels in the organization and should be as diverse as possible in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, age, ability, culture, and language. This team should be utilized for vetting all group, um, be a vetting group for all health equity and EDI related content. Remember, because we all swim in the waters of whiteness and have assimilated to it, um, it's important that this group also engages in their own internal work to advance their knowledge and understanding so, right, so that they are not repeating the harms. And so with my EDI committee, we met every three weeks. And so that meant one month we met monthly, but the next month we met twice. And so on the months that we met twice, the first time that we met would be agenda, right? Being like, okay, like we wanna complete these tasks. We wanna make these decisions. But that second meeting we would be just training. It would be all about training the EDI committee members so that they were in, in building up their knowledge, building up their skill set, building up their understanding, knowing how to navigate, making sure that that they could not only understand the, con uh, the foundational concepts of Jedi, but also embody and practice them. And so with the support of this advisory group, um, that's how I ended up drafting our EDI commitment statement, or North Star. 
Um, it's also how I got our equity, diversity, inclusion statement made, uh, sorry, definitions chosen. So again, that it fit us. We didn't do a cookie cutter. What I did was I gave them four definitions of equity. The EDI committee went through, picked out the words that they liked in each definition. I put them all together. I went to the C-suite, had them do the same thing, gave them four definitions and they picked out the words that they hacked. I synthesized both of those two things together and then made them pretty. And then I took them back to both people, both groups, and then they agreed upon them. And I only had to do it twice. I had to go back twice. But otherwise, we did it within a, you know, two meetings. So same thing with diversity, same thing with inclusion. I did the same thing with the EDI statement. Right? And so right there, I had the committee's buy-in, I had the C-suite buy-in, so that way, as we did our work going forward, if something came up and C-suite balked, and I'm like, well, based on the definitions that we drafted together, based on our statement that we did together, this is an alignment with what we say we want to do. It's an alignment with what we say we want to go. Oh, yes, hold on. Hold, hold. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So, um, C so everybody's, everybody's organization is different. The organization I worked for previously, it was our C, uh, chief um, executive officer, our chief medical officer, our chief dental, our chief financial, um, and then our chief um, people and equity officer. For other teams, it's your executive director, right? It's that executive team at the top. Sorry for my acronyms, and thank you for naming it. Um, again, this is not cookie cutter, which means you need to assess in your organization what your problem is, <laughs> right? You can't, uh, and please, please don't assume you know. I need you to assess, and so also part of your handouts, you have, I think, four assessments. You have a short assessment, you have an extended assessment, you have a board assessment, you have an executive assessment, right? And so, and this is, it's not the table handout, it is the, the, the digital handouts, okay? So I gave you a variety of handouts to be given, I mean, a variety of assessments to be done at various levels in your organization. Assess. Your assessment needs to be anonymous. I cannot stress the importance of this. People, don't trust, people do not trust organizations. There are studies out there that show this. And so if it, it is not anonymous, people are not gonna be honest with you. So it needs to be anonymous, because the reality is when you are doing this work, retaliation is real, okay? And if you truly want to know what's going on, you need to make people feel safe, okay? So it needs to be anonymous. I learned from my mistake, it needs to be short, which is why you have a short assessment and a long one. <laughs> it needs to be easily accessible. If people can easily assess it, it's great. Um, nowadays, you can m make a QR code very easily for your documents. So I would make a QR code, post it in the bathroom, post it in the break room, so while they're waiting for their food to heat up, they can simply take a picture of that QR code and then do the assessment on their phone, right? Quick and easy. Um, also making it so that they can come back to it is helpful. Um, if possible, that was another complaint that I got about mine. They're like, it's too long and I couldn't come back and finish it. And I'm like, my apologies. Um, the other thing, oh, and asking for 10 minutes, because remember, if you keep it 10 minutes long, then you can also ask for 10 minutes during your staff meeting, right? Because again, if we're really committed to this, then you can give me 10 minutes. And so that's another way, to, again, to make it as accessible as possible. The other thing that I did, so my organization, again, when we fully staffed, it was 700. When I did this, it was about 600. 
And I didn't have a lot of success with the paper assessment because, again, they said it was too long, so I'm, tell I'm telling you how to fix that. But the other thing I did was I did racial caucusing. And so I had, I met with BIPOC people and then I met with white people. And when I did this, I gave them our EDI statement that was drafted by our, our executive team and our EDI committee. And I gave them our EDI statement and I asked them, when it comes to us embodying this EDI statement, what do you see as our strengths? So what are we doing well? What do you see as our weaknesses? What can we be doing better? What do you see as opportunities or areas of growth? And what do you see as threats or roadblocks? Meaning what's gonna limit or, or inhibit us from embodying our EDI commitment? Those are the four questions I asked. When I did this racial caucusing, it was me. I was not in a leadership position at the time, which helped. Um, as we spent time together, I don't come off as your typical leader either, which also helped people feel comfortable being honest with me. I recorded what people said. I did not record it who, when, or where. So this literally just went into a big Excel spreadsheet and it got all mixed up. And so that, again, so it was anonymous. And I, out of 700 employees, I got at least 350 to engage with me, right? So that's half, that's, right? Because remember, I said at 700 when fully staffed, but we only had 300 when I was doing it, right? So I had a 50% return. After I compiled everything, I put, made it into themes, being like, okay, there's, I noticed a trend. They're like, we have this theme, which is more HR, this theme, which is more, um, employee support and employee engagement, right? There are a couple of themes that came up. I divided them into themes, put the, the big topic things into my executive report. And my assessment, I customized it, just like I told you to do. Based on the surveys that I'm giving y'all, I basically customized this survey. Um, so it wasn't necessarily scientifically vetted. And my results still showed Something that I'm sad to say, executive leadership knew 12 months beforehand. So 12 months beforehand, the executive leadership had a consultant come out and do an assessment that was just a basic HR assessment. And everything that I identified as a hot spot are the same things that that external consultant identified. Now I promise you I did not get paid with that external consultant get paid. But that's neither here nor there. That's why I'm like, you're going to give Stacy some time. You're going to give Stacy, like, right? You're going to be good to Stacy um, if you use an internal, internal person. Um, but the good news was it vetted what I did was accurate, right? Even though it was only 50%, it still proved like these are the hot spots. This is what we need to address. And so then, based on that, we created a plan. We're gonna bounce for a minute. Oh, where did you go? Let's see. No. Now, I put this in here last night. There we go. I'm like, I know it's there somewhere. <laughs> we created a plan. And so, and we used RACI. You can use any template that you want to. And so we just made sure, um, based on that, I gave it to the EDI committee. The EDI committee identified four top areas that we wanted to address. And then we also identified some micro affirmations that we wanted to do. Because some of the top things that we wanted to address were big. And it was gonna take time to do them. And we also knew it was important that people saw something happening as a result of the assessment. Because one of the complaints is, we tell y'all all the time what's wrong, but y'all don't do nothing about it. Right, so we knew those micro affirmations were important. And so again, based on the feedback that we got, the EDI committee came up with some micro affirmations. And so that was our dual focus. And on here, it showed that 
although um, we had an executive buy-in, but we had our equity manager, which I became, um, everybody had a role. The EDI committee had a role. Our EDI champions had a role. Everybody had a part to play. So, um, no, but I can. So um, remember, I like last the slides that are up right now are last week's slides. All this was done last night around ten o'clock. <laughs> but I will upload. I will. I will upload it. Um, a conversation came up. I think it was in our clinicians of color meeting that we had on Monday. Um, your EDI committee. So our, my EDI committee was made of a varying roles. So it was direct care staff, it was mid-management, and I did have an executive person on there. The executive person that was on there um, was our sponsor and the person who we got buy-in from at the executive team. If the executive person that is gonna be on your team is not someone that authentically, and I'm being really serious, authentically supports it, find a different executive person or don't put one on there because otherwise they will cause harm. Okay, uh, there's one in the back, Lauren. Give us a second, Lauren's coming. Sorry, if I could just uh, ask a question about micro uh, affirmation. Could you give an example of what that is? It sounds interesting. So these were, these were small things that, so a perfect example is we chose to celebrate multicultural holidays which, and acknowledge them, which we had not been doing, yet we clearly serve a multicultural community. And so on our social media account and in our clinics, we highlighted Holly, we highlighted Diwali, we highlighted Eid. We, you know, like we highlighted all of the cultural holidays that either our staff or patients represent. Um, so that was one of our micro affirmations. It was something that elevated diversity and celebrated differences. And again, it was recommendations that came that were based off of our EDI assessment and came from our EDI committee. Make sense? Yeah. So it's. Uh like celebrations, I was wondering if it was in response to microaggressions. It's not a strategy to counter that. No, it's not a strategy, okay. to, strategy to counter microaggressions. It was just um, something to do that, that, will, that the staff would see as a positive thing, that the staff would see as a immediate supportive action that was easy to do, that was tangible and easy to do. Any other questions? Okay, all right. Oh, I, so I wanted to explain. So um, this is what, when I, when, we, when I did the EDI committee, um, this is how we drafted it. And so we had the EDI committee. We eventually got rid of the steering committee members um, because I felt that was bureaucracy and just a roadblock. We identified what the, each of these, the the point of each of these roles. So the EDI committee was to work in collaboration to identify and address equity, diversity, and inclusion issues within our organization. I'm like, and if this would work. Like I said, we got rid of that, uh, the, the steering committee. And I'm like, my little cursor won't show up for me because that would be just too much like nice. All right, so then we're just gonna do this. Because again, I said I did this last night, so I did not print it out. Um, our, our staff members, they're per, they were proposed to give us perspective and insight to the needs, thoughts, and lived experience of our staff and patients. Um, and they were to work in collaboration with the EDI committee. Our facilitator was to help us navigate the gray areas, stalemates, tensions, stagnations, and make sure we were staying um, in adherence with our guideposts, we used the, in, um, the IHI, the, um, which is blanking on me right now. I had mentioned it earlier. And it's a tool that you have um, 
but we they have guideposts on how to do this, and so we use them as a guidepost. Um, I uh, was the facilitator. Our local champions provided us perspectives on intent versus impact in their departments and in patient care. Our sponsor, which was our C-suite person, um, our executive person, facilitated buy-in from management and agreed and got us a commitment of organizational resources. Um, SLT, which, get, which again is our overarching senior leadership team, um, provided managerial support on our EDI initiatives and provided perspective and insight to what is applicable and easy to do and what we would, where we would encounter barriers um, and was to collaborate with us on how to remove or dismantle barriers so that the action could happen. I guess we didn't engage our board as much, and again, that is something that I'm like, okay, definitely wanna do in the future. Um, but our board represented the communities and the priorities of the organization, and in theory would help us be accountable, right, on the grand scheme. We were unionized, and so um, JLMC was our joint labor management committee, and so this was leadership from the union and leadership from inside the organization, and they made sure that we abide by what the union wanted us to do when it came to equity, because they had their own thing. Um, staff members could volunteer as local champions, and then patients, of course, always are to give us feedback and help us make sure that, again, our impact match our intent. And so having a setup, so like if you create a committee, it's important for you to have the roles and then important for those people to know what I'm supposed to do in those roles, right? Okay. Also important, I'm come. Also important for you to have um, safe space agreements, right? So we, when we are in community, when we are in partnership, something that we don't talk about very often is how are we going to be in partnership? What are our mutual agreements when we are in this space, when we are engaging with each other? Okay. Um, quick question. So going back to what you were saying on the roles, is there kind of non-negotiable roles because I think it would be difficult in my organization to find everyone that can fit, like having 10 people in that committee. So what are the non-negotiables in those roles? Oh. <laughs> um, you need a facilitator. You need a, com you need a committee member, somebody who's gonna be on there, right? Which you want diverse as possible. Um, having the executive sponsor, if you don't have a union, you don't need it. We just happen to be unionized. That's not a mandatory thing. Um, I think local champions are helpful, but if you find another way to get that immediate feedback, you can do it that way. Uh, Lauren. So for your, your committee, was, were they making recommendations that then had to be approved by somebody else or like, I know you didn't go in details of what was in your plan, but I'm kind of curious, like, what your experience was with that. Like, did you find that there was tension between the committee and your, and your C-suite or with other staff? Or how did that, how did that work in, on the ground? So in our beautiful sweet spot, when I had my CEO buy-in, my CEO sat on my EDI committee. And so she knew what we were. So we had so we identified the initiatives based on the EDI assessment. So they told the staff told us what the hotspots were. The EDI committee prioritized them. Um, my my CEO was part of that, so she knew. As a committee, we came up with interventions, so she knew. She co-signed, and then we rolled out. Now, if you don't have that which can happen too. So let's say you only have buy-in up to the director level. Directors can dictate what happens on their teams and department. As long as it's not an overarching um, tactic that touches everybody, all you need is your director buy-in. 
So a perfect example is when it came to data, Jedi and data, I'm like, um, the Institute, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, that's what IHI is. Um, it says that when you collect data, you should be ca catching race, um, language, ethnicity. I added social orientation and gender identity and housing status, because hello, right? Um, and so I had the director of nursing buy-in. And she was the person who was in charge of our DOMA, which is our data cards. So I just talked to her, got her buy-in, went over to the data person, be like, hey, this is what we're doing. They're like, great. Did C-suite know? Nope. Did I ask? Nope. <laughs> right? It's one of those things where the quality, we're gonna find quality metrics, like this intervention is gonna give us quality metrics. And then in return will hopefully give me my return on investment that I can bring to the C-suite. Um, I am all about the workaround. Because <laughs> again, like I said in the beginning, you are going to have challenges. You are going to hit roadblocks. And if you allow those roadblocks to stop you, you will not get anywhere. You need your workaround. Figure out what that is. Um, and I'm that girl. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, because I want you to, I want you to practice languages. Was there any other questions? Um, Lauren, where, where's my... <laughs> On one of the previous slides, it talked about accountability being key. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, tangibly, logistically, what does accountability look like in this context? Just since the EDI committee is generally comprised of like folks of different degrees of organizational power that like how is one to hold like how do you hold hold your board accountable so we didn't have I didn't have to play with my board because yeah um but you see what I'm saying no no I, I get what you're saying yeah. I get what you're saying so in my situation the EDI committee is who held people accountable like we we're, we were the one who were naming things and calling things out when we saw them um, if someone wouldn't listen to us, because so in my EDI committee, even though we were in different roles, hierarchy is out the door. I don't allow that in any of the spaces I'm in. And so if that's not something that you can adhere to, then you don't need to be on the EDI committee where I'm at. Um, if somebody was, if something was happening that, so a perfect example is we had one clinic administrator who was being very difficult about letting me do the EDI assessment. Who held him accountable was my sponsor, which happened to be my CEO, right? And so your CEO, your director, whoever is gonna be your sponsor, whoever's that top person that gives you buy-in, that is the person that's gonna help you with that accountability piece. I also included in the handouts accountability principles so that you can figure out how this is gonna work for you. Because again, what worked for me may not work in your organization. Okay, um, question here and then in the back. <laughs> you kind of already answered my question. Oh. <laughs> um, but since I have, I have the floor a little bit, I wanted to know how the, the hierarchy piece worked where you said that uh, senior management was just an extra layer and you did away with that. How do, was that well received or my how did that go? My CEO was awesome, and I was, I was heartbroken when, when I lost her. Um, because, and, and let me be clear, she was a white woman in power, so she was not perfect. I didn't need her to be perfect. I needed her to be open. I needed her to be willing to hear what needed to be said and not get lost in her fragility. And she could do that, right? Um, so yeah, so she, and because, because she is that woman, she was okay not playing CEO in the committee. And that's what you need. You need somebody who's okay with, with bringing their experience, bringing their knowledge without having to bring their title. And so, and that's why I, and that's why I said in the beginning of this, if you have somebody who, who's not authentically about this work, because if you're about Jedi, then you know that hierarchy can have a toxic aspect to it. 
and you need to know when to you when to, when hierarchy is important and when you need to step out of it. And so if that person isn't about that, then they can't be on the committee. They're just not the right person for that. Sorry, the one in the back one in the front. So kind of just going off of that, um, when you push for a uh, DEI committee and you get that, which is kind of what happened at our, our organization, um, they created the DEI committee and then I found out it was kind of closed. Like we didn't, I didn't know what was going on. So I would email, I'm like, what are y'all doing? Like, cause you know, nobody, you're having these meetings, but we don't see anything happening. Um, and it took a long time to actually get one of, you know, my staff members um, finally got, you know, onto the committee. But our CEO is also there, and it's like everybody's afraid to, to mm. kind of talk. And I'm like, you know, if I was on it, I'm like, I'm going to be blunt. I'm going to say what's going on. But my staff member is not in that kind of role. So I find it hard to, like, they're there, they have it, they're doing the work, but nobody's, everybody's scared to say, like, what the issue is. That CEO does need to be there. Or the facilitator needs to set the norm of this is a psychologically safe space, and that's why you have those safe space agreements. Right? I mean, don't get me wrong, um, not everybody on my EDI committee totally trusted my prior CEO, um, but they did trust me. And her and I had developed a relationship where I could be a whole, completely honest with her. And I always ask them, like, you ready for this? Because if you ask me, I'm gonna give you an answer. <laughs> Yeah, it has, it has to be a safe space. It has to, has to, has to be a safe space. And so, so yeah, so either they need to not be on there, maybe a different sponsor, executive sponsor who can cultivate safe space, um, and, the, and who's leading it? I guess that's my question too. Yeah, I think, so, um, so the person that's leading it is, um, she's a, a, a woman of color and she's our pharma, the pharmacist right now, and they rotate through, but, and it's not necessarily that he, our CEO is like, like not receiving anything well like he's great at receiving i think it's just people are intimidated because we've never had it before and they they're not they've never been in that role to be able to directly influence and, okay. Yeah. okay so then they just need to they need to cultivate that culture so there just needs to be a pause mm -hmm. and then they need to actually stop and name that this is this exists and what do we need to do to create psychological safety so people can actually be honest in this room I need you to come there, and I just need you to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and sometimes it's easier when you have an external person. Lauren, there's another one right up here. Um, because, you right, like, I don't, I'm not risking anything, right? Um, I happen to be um, a rebel girl, and so, like, I'm, I've reached that age where I'm just going to say what it is. It is what it is. And I say it what I say it. Um, <laughs> And, and I still am always trying to cultivate healing, right? That has been a theme throughout today's message, right? How do we heal this? How do we heal this? I just get a little sassy on the side. <laughs> still kind of the same question in like how, how you could get to that point of trust. And um, I just wonder, like you're going to need time, maybe a different space, that's what I would say, like, even when I, I try to do that type of exploration is you may need a, like a non-work space, like a, something like a retreat or yeah, that, so that's what something that you even get to know the person more like a, a, a non-work related uh, side. So that you start kind of knowing, well, this is the person I thought she was like that, but she's not. So that, that's what I see. It's, it's, it's a process. but. That's why I see the trust again is, it, is, is the challenge. So. Yes, like, I mean, if you, if you can get them to swing for a retreat space, like even for a half a day, I'm like, go for it. But yes, you need to build that trust. I'm gonna fast forward real quick, because um, I was gonna do something, but we're gonna switch up. Um, Psychological safety is a shared belief that a group is safe for taking interpersonal risk. I can ask questions, admit mistakes and knowledge gaps. I can offer my perspective and ideas freely without hier regardless of hierarchy. I can raise concerns and name conflicts without fear of reprisal. I feel seen, heard, and valued. 
And so for that EDI committee, y'all need to define, step back and define what would demonstrate psychological safety for y'all. Right? So that we can um, cultivate that culture, so that we can be honest. Because again, if we cannot be honest, if we can't be transparent, right, then we can't really get to the root of what needs to be done. Also, um, I, so we had, a, we had a Jedi Affinity Group yesterday, and these are questions that I asked. Um, what would active support look like for you from your leadership? So having the team identify this, the committee identify this and name this, and talk about it. Again, it's all about cultivating that culture on that committee so that people feel safe, so that people can engage authentically and be honest. And so these are things that I need from my leadership. This is what active support looks like for me. Um, I'm always giving examples and just to kind of like get your juices going. Um, but then y'all need to define what it is for y'all. And again, I, I promise I'm gonna upload, I'm gonna update the slide so y'all have this. <laughs> um, and the other piece is what would active support look like from your allies? So again, this is being in partnership, this is being in community with each other. As a committee, identify, name this. So again, so there's a so we have a foundational level, right? Um, and again, if you can, if you can get a retreat space, it'd be great to have like a half day workshop on like doing this so you can really create that culture of community and connection and partnership. Uh, but if not, just do it over a couple of meetings. Okay. Um, I also ask what does active support look like for yourself? because we can't control nobody but us, right? We can ask people we're in partnership for what we need, but we can't control nobody but us. So I always um, also include what does active support look like for you? And again, these are just my own personal examples. Um, I always tell people when I do presentations and training, y'all gonna learn way more about me than y'all ever thought. <laughs> But I model transparency and vulnerability because that's what's required in this work, and I model it so that you will model it back to someone else. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. I'm just going to, y'all going to bear with me. We're going to switch some things up. So it was asked earlier. What does the emotional labor of this work look like? Like, how are we gonna address that? And so what I did with the affinity group yesterday is I asked them this question. Like, as you are going about your day doing this work, I want you to think about what does the emotional labor of this work look like for you? I need you to identify that, right? Because when you need your next mental health day, and you follow up with your supervisor, you're gonna to need to be able to be like, yep, I need these mental health days because this is what I am dealing with. This is the burden that I need your help in supporting me around. This is the burden that needs to be spread out because one person doing this is too much. You're gonna to need to be able to name it, right? Um, and again, these are just mine. Um, and so then act, so having what, knowing what your active support look like is also going to help with your emotional burden because then you know what do I need to do for myself you're going to know what do I need it to look like from my other colleagues and my allies and I want to point out that allyship is an active word it is action. It is not a button, a hat, or a flag. Okay? So if you are not matching your label of allyship with action, you ain't no ally. 
Just saying. Um, and, 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 and our allies don't have our lived experience, right? Depending on what racialized, gendered eyes, right? Whatever socialized label body you're in, your allies don't always know. And so we need to be able to name it and share it and ask. Now, they can tell us no. And then you just know to take them outside that, you know, that bubble that I showed you, you don't put them in the inner circle. I say you take them off the page, but you can push them in the back. They may, <laughs> they may make, change their mind later, but, right? Uh, but we have to tell them. People don't know. We are not taught to be in partnership with each other. We are not taught to be in community with each other. So we have to have these conversations. Same thing with our leaders. Um, every leader is different. Um, historically, leaders have not been taught how to be good leaders. They have been taught to work in the model of whiteness norms, which when done to the exclusion is harmful. Um, and so we need to have these conversations. And so again, again, this is just what I need from my leadership. Having that psychological safety, what does that demonstrate? How does that demonstrate it for you? Because again, people won't know because we're all different. And then what does nurturing yourself look like? That is also super, super, super important. And again, looks different. And I will say, because um, this is, again, this is my nurturing. Um, somebody came up to me after the affinity group yesterday and was just like, that seems really intense. How long did it take you to figure that out? And I was like, well, I went on mental health leave for PTSD the first time 12 years ago. And then I just did it again last fall. <laughs> I'm um, like, so it's been a process. <laughs> um, but I also told her that I have inspirational quotes that sit in front of my desk every day that remind me to take care of myself, that remind me that I am enough, that remind me I don't have to fit in this box, right? I also have a playlist. I also have a variety of other supports that I do daily. It is a daily thing. Um, and so again, just figure out what works for you. And all of those pieces together will help lighten the load. It will not get rid of it. I am not gonna lie to you and say that. But it will help lighten the load because you will have allies to go to that will support you you will have a process that will help you compost what you no longer can carry. And for me, I also have my soul tribe on the outside who loves me unconditionally. So all the things that I had to carry and deal with during the day, I can go to them and be like, WTF, and have a total ratchet moment. <laughs> right, they gonna still love me because they just know I'm going through a moment. <laughs> And then I can come back, right? Compost, let that stuff go. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about, I am. Spirit tells me I need to do this. And so people keep telling me I need to do this. Um, I want to build a monthly um, Jedi support group space. Um, because no matter when I have this conversation, where I have this conversation, everybody's like, how do we do this emotional labor thing? And so having a support space, I feel, is definitely important. So it's something I'm working on. Okay. I'm like, I'm gonna go back. Okay, because there's some things I want to cover really quick. Um, drafting your definition. So you have the slide, and I purposely did it, the colors the way that I did it, because what I did was I took the pieces that I liked from this one, and the pieces I liked from this one, and made my own definition, okay? And so on your table, you have handouts of Jedi definitions and Jedi EDI statements. And I'm like, I got like 15 minutes. 
Um, so we can't practice it, <laughs> but <laughs> you have an example. You have a list of definitions. And when it comes to making your own language, that's all it is. Come together as a team. Give your team the definitions, right? Figure out what words you're going to focus on. Give your team the definitions. Literally have them tick the pieces that they like and then put them together into one statement. And then there you go. You've got your first definition in your glossary of terms for your organization's Jedi language. Any questions? And so same thing with our, the EDI statement or North Star or whatever you want to call it. Again, I was very intentional about the color usage. So you can see I took what I liked from here. I took what I liked from this one. And then I took what I liked from the last one. I combined them together and made a statement. And so I also provided you with a handout, and all of this is electronic as well, a variety of statements that you can choose from. These are only a sample of a few. You can go find your own, you can draft your own from the scratch, whatever you wanna do. My goal was to give you some starter tools in order to right, start the journey forward, help to make it a little easier. I will say that I did notice like if we started from like scratch to just a blank page, it tends to intimidate people. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. But if I gave them some suggestions, then it was easier to draft these words and draft these statements. And as people, particularly when you do it with a group of people, it really does involve into something that is uniquely your own and that is meaningful. I swear I always run out of time. Um, okay, I wanna say important, important things in order to do this work in my opinion. Um, cultivate self-knowing. I need you to be self-reflective. I'm like, and I need you to be authentically self-reflective, which means I need you to see the really nice, warm, fuzzy pieces, as well as the ugly pieces that we don't like talking about, right? We can't ignore them. They're usually there to teach us a lesson. It's called shadow work, look it up. Um, make sure that you include intersectionality. Being trauma responsive is absolutely a must. We all have lived experiences that influence how we show up and how we engage. Make sure that you're being anti-racist in thought and action. Person first language, you need to see the human that is in front of you and not just the label or role that you have put on them or that society has put on them or that they feel within the organization. Psychological safety, and I am a huge fan of relational leadership and collaboration. Um, so that means my leadership is in partnership with me. Again, I'm not a huge fan of hierarchy. Um, okay. Up on your table, there is a handout called Healing Centered Restorative Engagement. It is a tool that I like. It is a tool that you can use in partnership with patients or with your team. It is to help to build that nurturing foundational relationship with each other. And if you have any questions on these, like you're gonna get my contact information being like, Kavanya, we ran out of time at the end, but you mentioned this and I want to talk about it more. Feel free to reach me. Um, okay. On this hand, um, on the slide deck that you're gonna get, there's a list of direct routes, many of which we talked about, which include, um, Jedi lens for um, leaders to use, getting an equity lens, educating your team on developing a shared language, um, affinity groups, ally groups, 
Um, so this is a whole list of direct actions that you can take if you need tactics, if you need first step tactics suggestions for your team based on, and these are very general. Again, I say that you should always do the EDI assessment and then based on the EDI assessment, apply what is recommended here that fits you. Um, but I wanna go over the indirect route because some places are like, nope, we're not doing that. And so the indirect route I suggest is you do it from a quality metric standpoint. And this means that rather than naming anti-racism, rather than naming Jedi from the beginning, right, we're gonna work on it indirectly through quality metrics. But we're gonna do a root cause analysis. Meaning, we're gonna focus on be like, okay, what are the best ways we can support staff to meet our complex patient challenges? Focusing on a top ten, a clinical group, <clears throat> such as diabetes or blood pressure. But when we look at diabetes and blood pressure, right, we're gonna be like, oh, okay, well, what patient population does this primarily represent that is, we're struggling to meet our metrics on? Oh, okay, well, what community are they from? And what struggles are tip, like, typically happen in that community? Because again, we know 80% is what happened outside our clinic walls. So 20%, we're doing the best I can, but what else do, should we be considering? Oh, well, when I look at the social economic, the cultural right, background, I'm finding this trend. You see where I'm going? You still gonna end up, <laughs> right, at equity and anti-racism. We just went in the back door, right? <laughs> back door, side door, window. I'm like, I do whatever I can. I go whichever route is open because I know the front door ain't never open for me, ever. Um, but yeah, being like, oh, African American males, what are African American males are experiencing? What you know, like, what is the? Why do that? Why is it that population and not any other population, right? Like you are going to end up at the same root cause. You're just going to go, like I said, around. Um, so you're going to connect how these things are compounded. The more intersectionality is present, um, we're going to look at generational harms, medical mistrust, right? So again, we just don't name it in the beginning. Um, and I encourage the use of patient narratives or personas when we demonstrate our data, because it's very important that we, again, we see the human that is in front of us and not just the label or the number. Any questions? Because we are down to our last 10 minutes. <laughs> and I wanna make sure I'm responsive to questions. So it kind of sounds like this work could possibly trigger participants in the, the committee and setting up a type of like self-care plan or plan to help themselves if they are in a way moved by it or it affects them in such a way that it, they could not be in a good place. Is, is is a part of this and, and I just want to say thank you for that for bringing that to light because I, I do have a committee of my own that I'm working with and these considerations I have not made mm -hmm. and um, thank you for that you're very welcome and that's why the education what we did education on the second meeting of the month um, and when we did education I had time for discussion um, we also had a monthly anti-racism group at my organization that I facilitated that was outside of the EDI committee. We had a white ally group that one of my white allies facilitated. Um, so there were spaces for people to process the things that came up. Um, but if we needed to, we would process them in the EDI committee meeting as well. Was there another question? Girl, that was me the last two days. Um, I, I'm thankful that you brought some of this to light, but 
mostly we've been living this for how many years? So, we, you know, this is a discussion that has been discussed like over and over and over again. You know, and I think that's what hell holds us back on some issues is that we're not doing the work, we're doing a lot of discussing. So how do we, how do we monitor our, our gauge, our progress? Because a lot of people won't take up the task that you're taking up at as we speak because of the, uh, because of the, the, the drawback or the setback on our, our country's history. Who is going to go to fight when it's time to fight? I mean, people fade in the background. So this is a worthy task. However, if it doesn't um, progress, then we're going to get our butts kicked pretty much. Well, that's why we're getting our butt kicked. God forbid there's another pandemic because the only way it works is that we get in and we work together. So my, my, my um, success, I feel, that comes between one of the acronyms that you put up there is the SWAT. My, what's my strengths? What's my weaknesses? What's my opportunities? And what's my threats? But when I get down to threats, I can't look at my, my colleagues as a threat. And so we got to get in and work together in achieving, um, accomplishing any goals that we uh, pursue, especially in this healthcare area. Because, like I said, God forbid another pandemic, you know? So we got to put down the things that, that um, separates us, put down the things that that's just in our head is some, something, something that we were raised on our top. And we got to kind of like get ready because, I mean, this is not over. It's just the beginning. So that's why, I, that's, why I, I, um, that's why I'm here, actually. And not only that, but I, I'm here to, um, to seek every avenue that, that qualifies me as a professional. We all have positions, but some of us, we just don't operate as a professional, and that means that we treat each, all of us, the same. I treat no one different than I treat anyone else. And uh, so I can change me, and that's what I'm changing. So just to let you know, I appreciate you, and um, I enjoy my uh, stay here. All of you guys gave me something I could take home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your share reminds me that somebody asked me, they're like, well, I want to do this work, but it's going to be hard. What is your suggestion? I'm like, I don't sign up for this because it's fun. I do this because the system is going to kill me one way or the other. It can kill me and I can sit back and let it do it, or it can try to kill me and I can fight back. And so I have no other choice. And so the, those who don't have a lot of intersection marginalizations, I need you to recognize that. Right? Like, yes, you can totally buy out and be okay. I'm like, and know that the rest of us who are still in this fight are fighting for our lives, right? We don't have that privilege or that luxury. And so think about that. Um, again, I'm always centering healing. I'm always being like, hey, what does active support look like? Dear allies, hello, let's have a conversation. Let's be in partnership. Yeah, because you're right, it is. It's, it's coming for us. We know it. It is something that we navigate on a daily basis. So thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, feelings? So with everything that we have learned, um, me and my colleague here, uh, you just have to say where we're from, and you can understand that we're already in it. Um, we're in the thicket of it. We are from Florida, so that right there in itself is huge. And it's like we trying to get in back doors. We trying to get in cracks and walls. And it's just like every time we feel like we're moving or gauging in the right direction, we get so we get hit hard. And then we have to come up. It's, it's like we got to be like magicians and come up with everything to try to say, okay, let's get into this. And then it's always something there. And then you're like, oh, let's try this. And it's just like, were they at the window listening to us? Because every week something's being signed. Every week 
something's happening and it gets very frustrating and um got a lot of people just giving up but we're like really trying and it gets frustrating because like we need that space I have to take like maybe 15 minutes to myself a day just to try to figure things out and then you know I know it it can be like here we go (laughs) so like trying to figure it out get up in the morning and see how can we help people like let's help people so Um, for people in your situation rest is also an act of self-care and yes I know it means that the work won't get done that day but it also means you'll be there tomorrow right because if we don't rest particularly for us who are in those deep situations I'm like Remember, I told you the system is going to survive at all costs. And really, it's like when it comes to this system, it's like it's going to be me or you. And you know the system trying to make sure it's it, right? And so it's going to chew us up, and we can't allow that. We, there is tomorrow. There is always tomorrow. And it's going to be okay. And so that's why I said I'm serious. Girl, I'm like I am crystalled up. I got Crystals, I'm not because this is being recorded, so I'm not going to say everywhere I got crystals, but I am crystalled up. <laughs> I have essential oils. The oils that are on the table, those are for my personal oils, y'all, right? I do everything I can to care for myself because I know this system wants me to die, and I refuse to do it. And I still commit it to helping everybody, but I also know that I have to prioritize myself and help myself, too. I just wanted us all to give you like a huge group hug or anybody else that feels like you. Like I think we always, we all have our struggles, you know, I certainly have, but I think there's privilege that's gotten me to where I'm that CEO. But, you know, 35 years ago, I was sleeping in my car because I came out to my mother on... Um, so I think we all have that, but the color of my skin just saves me so much. You know, you can hide if you're a lesbian, which I did for 40 years. Um, but so I'm big hugs to any of you back there too. Thank you. This has been the most invigorating week that I've ever experienced. As I sat in the opening on Monday, it was just amazing to see the people. It's just not us, it's all of us. And you all have truly given the two of us something to look forward to when we get back home. We don't have homeless shelters. We don't have the sense of help in our areas. We live in Palm Beach County and Broward County. Dade County has some of those shelters and some of those things, but Broward and Palm Beach County has suffered immensely over the years. We're not gonna do it overnight and we know that. But there is a start and there is a light at the end of that tunnel. And I can guarantee you're going to see Broward and Palm Beach County in that light. And the inclusion of all of us not some of us. I'm amazed. And I told you this, not even knowing that I would see you today. On Monday, I've never had to do the things that everyone else has had to do to survive. I've always had. I was privileged, yes, I may be of this color, 
But I was privileged because I had a mother and a father that did not move us to the side to show something else. Everyone was the same. And I'm blessed to have three wonderful children. One who is very different, but he's beginning to change the world with what he does. And that's love everyone through music, through dance. But he's my special child. And I thank you all for everything that we've received here this week. We got a lot of work to do, but I know we'll get it done. I want to say, just as the two ladies here, you are from Florida, I'm from Mississippi. I'm probably the only one here at the conference from Mississippi. So as I was speaking to Kavonia at the, my first um, session, um, thanks to Shantae. Shantae did a beautiful job. I opened it with Shantae's session, ended it with Kavonia. So you ladies are amazing. Thank you, thank you. It, it really enlightened me. Um, but the work has to be done. People are hurting. People need healing. Um, I moved from Atlanta after 29 years to go back to my hometown, which is Mississippi. And I was all radical when I got there. I'm like, some changes need to be made. But just being immersed in it and knowing that it takes time and it takes work. And just your approach to Jedi, Kavonia, it has been enlightening. It's been healing with these essential oils. I'm like you, I stayed crystalled up, um, organited up, and, and everything. And so anything that I can do to, to help you know, heal the person in front of me when they leave, if they can feel better, um, if they can just be more hopeful um, when they leave, that my work is done one by one. And um, so I just want to thank you for this enlightening experience and keep doing the work that you're doing. All right, we are over time. I wanted to say thank you. If you have something to say to me, come up afterwards. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for staying late. Thank you for staying engaged. And I wish you all very safe travels.